So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this inaugural lecture from uh, Professor Luke DeWitt. Um, it was very nice to hear in the registration outside so many voices from the Netherlands. I gather there's a, there's a both Luke's family and friends and colleagues from Holland are, um, have come over um, for this prestigious event. Um, not to make Luke nervous, it is probably one of the most nerve-wracking lectures you ever have to give, is your, is your inaugural lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Pam Shaw, so I'm, I'm head of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health here at the University of Sheffield. And it's my great pleasure to um, briefly uh, introduce Luke before he gives his inaugural lecture which has the title of Technology, Who Cares? So, um, Luke was uh, appointed as Professor of Health Services Research in the Centre for Assistive Technology and Connected Healthcare, which is part of, it's one component of our school and health-related research, which is headed up by Professor John Nicol over on my left here. Uh, so he started with us in um, October of last year, um, and he's a really good fit for what we're interested in in Sheffield. So um, Luke has devoted his um, working life to investigating technology to support people um, with disabilities in their daily lives. And if I just embarrass him a little bit by um, Picking out some of the highlights from his CV, so he studied, studied medicine and then undertook a PhD at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He's held prestigious uh, positions both at Maastricht and in other universities, so Zoond University of Applied Sciences in Heerlen, uh, Wieland's National Centre for Long-Term Care in Utrecht. Um, he set up the National Centre for Care Technology Research in the Netherlands. Um, and what I gather from talking to Luke and, and reading his biography is that um, his research is aiming to support care practice and policy. He's been a PI on more than 45 projects in the field of long-term care and rehabilitation. And the main research themes that he's interested in, and he'll tell us about some of these, I'm sure, during his lecture, are assistive technology service delivery, development and evaluation of e-health applications, care robotics, healthcare innovation, and chronic disease management. And boy, do we need those skills in the days that we're living in now, where we're no longer dying of tuberculosis and infections and so on. We're living to a ripe old age and uh, the uh, prevalence of chronic and um, multiple diseases in our elderly population is exponentially increasing. Over his career, um, he's very modest in his CV. He says, I think, I think I've had about 15 million euros in research funding, but I didn't write all of it down. So he doesn't keep a meticulous record of all his prestigious funding. He's the author of uh, more than 200 <coughs> publications, and he has um, led and spearheaded a very interesting project, which is um, how to tackle health in the slums of India, which I will be very interested to hear more about. So that's Luke in a nutshell. We're delighted that he, um, we were able to entice him to come and work with us in Sheffield. And we're especially delighted because we had this concept of Care 2050. And um, that involves multiple different groups in the university, from arts and humanities to social sciences to um, the medical faculty. And it, I think there's a growing realisation um, that the health service in the UK and in many other countries is struggling with um, the change in uh, the changes required in healthcare. And we have this concept that we should be uh, using technology, changing our approach 
to um, address the new challenges um, in healthcare, and we called this concept Care 2050. And there's going to be a range of partners, ranging from the University of Sheffield, the NHS, industry partners, funding bodies, Sheffield Hallam University, as well as the University of Sheffield, and, and probably several more um, groups to come into this. So it's complex, it's going to need uh, a lot of pulling of different people together to, to make it work well. Um, so what we, um, the, the kind of headline about this concept is that it should be a world leading collaborative innovation environment in which we can identify, develop, test, champion and then implement technologies and systems which will deliver um, game-changing, affordable and sustainable future healthcare. I won't go into all the details of that um, slide, just in the interests of time, um, but what we're really trying to do uh, to get at is this um, triple aim here of reducing healthcare costs, achieving better health and well-being for our elderly populations in particular with, with multiple comorbidities and doing this in a way that increases um, the satisfaction of the people who are um, benefiting from um, uh, the healthcare systems. But, but we can't go on doing the same as we are at the moment. Innovation and changes are essential. And Luke, I think, is just the man to lead that um, with colleagues in Sheffield. So I'm going to finish there, hand over to Luke. Luke, we're um, delighted to hear your inaugural lecture this evening, and I'm sure it will be quite fascinating. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone feel pressure? <laughs> this is quite overwhelming. Uh, and my one one side of my brain says, well, let's get, and there you go and have a drink. Because she always, uh, you already told who I am and what my background is, so. Uh, no, but uh, I'm appointed here to do better, so. I will try. Technology, who cares? That's the title of my uh, talk. Um, and this question uh, stands for the feeling that many healthcare professionals and also other stakeholders in healthcare have when we talk about technology, who cares? And I hope to show you that we should care. And uh, I cannot think of any future healthcare without a significant role uh, for technology. Uh, so I think it's a crucial topic and we should get rid of this feeling, well, who cares? It also has another side to it it's also a question that many patients raise when we talk about technology. Who is going to care for me? Should it really be a robot? Um, and so on. And I think that's also a very relevant question. A question that deserves attention, that deserves research, and that's exactly uh, what, we, uh, what I would like to do here. So I hope after my talk you will delete the question mark um, and make it into technology we care. I'd like to welcome everybody. It's quite an overwhelming audience. Um, uh, we have about 30 Dutch people coming over, which is uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, and then students, colleagues, uh, family members, uh, partners of Catch. Uh, so, well, it's great that you're here. It's also indeed nerve wracking, I can tell you. But I hope um, not to disappoint you and apologize for my dumbish. <laughs> um, well, last October I uh, came over from the yellow country to the bigger red country, and that was quite a step. Because in the middle of the discussions of Brexit, I think 50 colleagues said, Are you really going there? <laughs> they will kick you out. Uh, <laughs> um, but in, uh, at this moment, I know many uh, colleagues in the university really like international connections, so I'm very happy to be here. But it was quite a step. 
it marks a real uh, change in my career, and not only in my career, also for my family, uh, because uh, this summer my wife and two of our children will come over as well. So it's quite a big step. Um, what will I be talking about? I will try to say a little bit about why there's a need for innovation. And I will try to explain that I think that's the reason why I'm here. That Sheffield has a fantastic starting position to become a real key player in healthcare innovation. I will tell a little bit about my interests, what I hope to do here, what I intend to do, and then zoom in on one of these topics because, as Professor Shaw already mentioned, I have quite a broad interest with four or five themes, and there's simply too much to talk about in 45 minutes. So I chose one, just an, as an example of what I think is necessary. Uh, and then some closing remarks, very short. So that's what I will talk about. <coughs> Challenges in healthcare. This is a picture of a nice castle. Um, it's not in the UK, it's a German castle. <laughs> um, for me, this picture that shows uh, our healthcare system, uh, our Western healthcare system, Devon, Netherlands, UK, it doesn't matter. We have a fantastic healthcare system, and we should be very proud of it, and most people are. Uh, we have many rooms, uh, we have hundreds of different professionals working in these rooms, uh, but there's a bit of a problem. Sometimes some of the rooms have obscure content, we don't really know what's in there, and others are grander and grander than the things that we want to be. Um, so from a distance, this looks wonderful. Uh, I travel quite a lot to India. And I've always also visited countries like China. What you see there is they're trying to build, to copy our castles. And I have big questions about that. Uh, because well, when you have a closer look, this is the inside of the castle. <laughs> it's full of cracks and crevices. And that's how our NHS system, but also the Dutch healthcare system, really looks from the inside. It's crumbling, it is almost uh, uh, yeah, being crushed by its own weight. For me, this is the real problem in healthcare. And if we go on the way we do, it will simply collapse as all these medieval castles have done. And this uh, UK is full of it. Um, so we have to be smart. If you look at how we innovate at until now in healthcare, it's very often we add things. And we have very um, well um, elaborated procedures to decide on should we do this extra or should we not. But we are very bad in deleting things. So intrinsically, in the way we innovate, we, we always add a room or we uh, clean it a little bit up or it's refurnished. But it, 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 in itself, it, it, this castle is only becoming bigger. And we can't go on like that. It will simply collapse. So I think we have to rethink healthcare. We have to really think about sustainable models of healthcare that serve more with less. And that is not only a national challenge, but strikes me very much in discussions in the, in the Netherlands. It's a political discussion, and it is as if it's only a Dutch problem. And here I see the same thing. People talk about problems of NHS. Problems are exactly the same. And it's the same in Germany, and it's the same in the United States. Of course, the castle looks different, uh, but the principal problem is, is exactly the same. It also connects uh, to the work in India. So many people ask me, why do you do this thing in India and work here on e health and e stuff? I think the solutions in these both settings are the same. We have to scale down, we have to reinvent our healthcare system. Yeah. And in developing countries, they have to create health systems, basically from scratch. And if you think about solutions, especially when you look at that from a technology point of view, the solutions are very similar, much more similar than we think. And that's why I like to combine these perspectives. So I think there is an absolute must for innovation. And it must be different from what we used to do. And adding things to all that. Now we have, there's a need for radical innovations. 
the zombie generation. Completely different models of care. And I don't see them that many. This is the kind of thing, that, this is not what I mean. This was a disruptive innovation in medieval times. Uh, it's a dentist doing its work. Uh, but we need real innovations, and there are many examples. One of the examples I, I one of my favorite examples is in the music industry, where the musician listened to music today. Ten years ago, you had to go to a record shop, you have to look and buy one, and then you could listen at home. And now it's all through the internet. You listen on your smartphone, wherever you are, you have access to everything available. And that is a real radical disruptive innovation that changes the whole scene. So I'm hoping for someone to come up with, with an innovation like that in healthcare. And that is possible, because technology has the potential to bring that. And these are just examples of technologies that are developing uh, with an incredible speed and really impressive developments. The upper left is an example of um, a 3D printing technology. Imagine you are that man. And by making a scan of one side of the face and mirroring it and printing it, he gets a new face. It's possible today. Not everyone knows that, but it's possible. The same technology, 3D printing, is an alternative of this terrible costs we have when your arm is broken. They're much, much more pleasant, much cheaper, much easier. Mm -hmm. The field of robotics, it's an arm support system, very smart thing. Um, down below uh, is, is an uh, example of uh, the social robot, very well known, Fargo Seal. Everyone, anyone see it? Anyone? Hold it. Yeah, yeah, you have all that. <laughs> My Dutch colleagues are very familiar with it. It's a, it's a wonderful technology, and it does things that people cannot do anymore. This thing is able to connect to people in a far stage of dementia, where I'm not able anymore. But this stupid robot can do it. Well, material science, new technologies, new materials, the whole field of digital health, uh, sensor systems that allow us to self-monitor all kinds of conditions. Um, so there's a whole range of technologies out there being developed with a huge potential for healthcare. At Catch, and I personally have always focused on long-term care. I think the biggest challenges in our healthcare system is not in the curative sector, of course, it's extremely important, but it's well developed. And the, the, the innovation mechanisms there are, are well, well in place. In long term care, elderly care, uh, people with disabilities, and uh, home care, that is a field that, that causes the, the biggest cost at this moment, and there's a challenge for the future. If you focus on that area, I believe there are two main domains that are extremely important, and that's exactly what Catch is doing, and that's also why I came here. It's the field of assistive technology and the field of connected healthcare. And why is that important? Uh, because I believe that uh, the only way to really change uh, the problem I, I mentioned is that we support people in being more autonomous, more independent, more uh, able to self-manage their conditions. And these are the technologies uh, that do that. <coughs> Strangely enough, enough the whole field of assistive technology is almost never mentioned in policy documents. You never hear about it. You seem to live in a kind of app time, an app era, where we think everything on the smartphone will solve everything. That's definitely not true. So I think these are the two main areas that we should focus on. Now I switch to Sheffield. Why is Sheffield such a great place? And well, it's the beating heart of the UK. <laughs> it's right in the middle. And it's a vibrant city. I was very happy that some of the colleagues uh, from, the, from the Netherlands that came over just sat in the corridor. It's such a lively city. And that's exactly what it is. And that's not just because it's in the middle. It's because we have a lot of extremely relevant partners. 
Yeah, there's two universities, where a strong group of Sheffield Robotics, uh, so Classic Institute, uh, uh, the NIHR Clark Network, uh, we have the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center, um, and this is not complete, this is just yesterday I came together. Um, and if you look at it, it's a fantastic potential. And I really have not seen any region before with such a potential, with only one critical remark. It is not optimally connected. Yeah, it took me quite some time, but I think maybe it's a little bit British thing, because it also took me some time to understand what England and Great Britain and UK and how all that works. <laughs> and, well, it's a little bit of a problem with all these organizations, but if you look at it from a little distance, and that's, that's a nice thing if you come new into the city, you see it. But it's fantastic. It's all there. So if we would be able to connect that on the one, one yeah, larger scale, higher level um, mission, uh, uh, joint umbrella, um, that aligns the energy and potential of all these organizations and networks, then we would really become one of the leading centers for healthcare innovation. Because we have all the technology, and it's, it's not technology alone, it's also the psychology you need, the social sciences you need, the evaluation, uh, the economic evaluation side, the healthcare practice. And it's all present at the large scale and high level. And that's what I liked about the CAT 2050 uh, idea. Uh, I heard about it when we were exploring the possibilities of coming here, and I went, that, that's a great thing. And I like it because there is kind of that umbrella and that joint vision uh, to work together towards. And it is challenging because it says 2050. In the Netherlands, we have a similar program here yeah, 2030. <laughs> <laughs> That's tomorrow. <laughs> and it's important because when you talk about 2030, you immediately end up in, in discussions about competition and, and overlap. 2050 is far away. So it enables you to think really out of the box. Yeah. And that's what we should do. So, what I meant, what am I interested in? Um, well, these two things are not very surprising. Yeah. You will see assisted technology, you will see connected healthcare, and health and science. I already explained, I think that it is extremely um, interesting to combine that. We are now doing a project in slums in India using uh, up to date e health technologies uh, to develop uh, medical devices that can be operated by non medically trained staff, just people with some basic education living in the slum, allowing them to do part of the healthcare uh, monitoring, diagnostics uh, without being a doctor. Um, and that's possible. And the way we do that, and the things we find out there, are extremely relevant to the situation here because we can translate it back and can learn a lot from that. So this is my interest, this is what I like. Well, just some pictures to show what it's about because many people think assistive technology well. Who of you has an assistive device? Oh, I see at least 20 more. Glasses. Put them off, please. <laughs> Who has a hearing aid? Put it up, please. <laughs> Who has a smartphone to remember what he had, appointments he has? <laughs> Throw it away, please. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's assistive technology to all of us. So if you have a disability, it becomes really vital. Um, and it's nothing new. It's not maybe not so sexy, as they say. I mean, here is a picture of the first, as far as I know, first described assistive device ever. 3,000 years before Christ, found on the, in the pyramid in Egypt. And John the walking came. In the middle, it's a, it's a bit more fancy. It's a, it's a result of fantastic new material sciences. This guy who is wheelchair dependent runs faster than anyone of you in this room. Well, the robotics already showed. So it is a, it's a huge field with not, maybe not that uh, appealing, not the sexy things, but extremely important things. 
Um, Collected healthcare, of course. Well, I already mentioned all these apps that are available. Uh, the main challenge here is to find out what works and what doesn't work. If you know that there's, a, I think, about 100,000 100, health apps on the, on the app stores. So, and 99,000 of them are bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know. So that's an area of research in itself. And this, of course, is some pictures from the health and slums. Totally different setting, but thinking about the solutions there, we come up with similar uh, possibilities. One of my PhD students in the, in the Dutch, uh, well, she's Indian, she works in India, but still a student from Maastricht University, works on, on the research trying to understand how the United Nations standard rules on, on the rights of people with disabilities are translated into these communities. Well, the answer is clear, not at all. Yeah. But how can you yeah, develop the answers for this, these kind of settings? So this is what I like to do, and it's, it's obvious, you can only do that in an international context. You have to collaborate with others. And from that point of view, I dare to say that Brexit is not a very smart, smart thing. <laughs> because we need these problems. We need these problems. It is, it is not, not a UK problem. Dutch problem, it is a global problem. So I promise you to say a little bit more about assistive technology, more in depth. Try to. This is the problem statement that drives me in this field. This is a statement coming from the WHO, World Health Organization. They state that one billion people in the world today have some kind of visibility and that might be alleviated with some kind of technology. And if you look at who has access to these technologies, it's only 10, 15% of the population. So 85% of people in need are not served worldwide. And of course, you immediately think, oh, well, here it is different. No, here it's not different. I will show you in a minute. <coughs> also here, many people who might have profit from technologies, do not have access to them. We also know that visibility is uh, disproportionately uh, distributed in communities. That's always the, the, the poor people. <coughs> oh, you can't understand. <coughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> it's always the poor, it's the people and women, all the people in, in weaker positions that have the, the, yeah, the worst situation. And visibility occurs more in these uh, groups. And as I said, only a very small minority has access to assistive technology. That is why, for me, that's a big issue. And it is not just me who says that. There is international legislation in this field, and many people don't know that, but the United Nations, already years ago, have made the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that convention explicitly says that states are, they must provide these kind of technologies to their citizens. Well, you can look it up. <coughs> I'm not going to go into the details. But this is international legislation. And if you see how many countries have signed that convention, all the dark blue <coughs> are countries that said, yes, we accept this, we ratify this, this is for us, it has the status of legislation. And if you look what these countries do, it's the opposite. Because in every country, getting access, getting access to assistive technology is, is becoming worse. So there's a big gap between what we say in this, this area of, of United Nations and what we do in practice. So it is not only the problem of the south of the world, but it is, it's really a uh, global problem. The WHO has taken an initiative, and they put this very high on the policy agenda. They said it's one of our six major uh, areas of concern, and they initiated, they launched the GATE initiative. I forgot what it stands for, but it sounds good. It's GATE initiative. <laughs> um, and the idea is to, to put it on the agenda and to develop tools for governments to do something in this field. Um, they did basically two things in that initiative. Um, one is they produced a priority assistive devices list, 
a lot of debate about it. But they published this list. Don't go through the details, can look it up. Of 50 devices of which they say uh, this is what every country on the world should provide to its citizens. It's interesting to look at that list and ask yourself, is, is this really true for the UK? Is it true for the Netherlands? So this is one thing they did. The second thing, and that is really new, no one of you can have seen this, it was published this week, and uh, that is the Global Research Agenda. And I was lucky enough to work on that uh, with a team uh, from uh, across the world. We have developed this agenda. And the idea is, of course, very clear. This is what WHS tries to stimulate research in this field. Uh, and I was uh, in the lucky position to coordinate that process. Looking at the agenda, um, it basically has five major themes. And these are also the themes that I think we should be addressing uh, here locally, because they're basically the same. If you look at what we know about the effects and the impact of assistive technology, it's barely nothing. If you look at medical interventions, pharmaceuticals, it's thousands of publications. If you look in PubMed, the, 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 the list of all the publications in the world, let's say, and look up what's known about assistive technology, it is a, a fraction. And if you also know that the number of assistive devices is at least 100 more, 100 times more than we have in, in pharmaceuticals, that's very strange. We researchers don't do this, and we should. Shar has a fantastic group, perfectly able to tackle this. So, well, you are no longer, yeah, you, we will talk about that. <laughs> Um, so that, that's one area. That's really important research. And just this, this small uh, funny thing I did, take off your glasses, take off your hearing aids, throw away your, your agenda, that, that, that already helps to get a feeling of how important technology is in everyday life. Second thing is about policy systems, how to get things to people, because the device is fine, but it's very crucial that you get the right thing in the right way and I will prove that in a, in a second. Uh, there is a big need for high quality affordable assistive technology. Uh, there, is fan there are fantastic uh, prostheses for, for and, and fantastic um, um, computer uh, steered joints, knee joints. Fantastic, 10,000 euros. Totally inaccessible for anyone outside our, outside our countries. And we produce them but also in Germany, one of the biggest producers, and then we ship them to India and get more and more expensive. Sheffield has all the possibilities to develop very cheap solutions on the basis of proven technology. Not sexy, but extremely important. So that's what I think we should do. The other thing is training, training people in this field. There is no official training to become an assistive technology service provider. Occupational therapists do this, some physiotherapists do it, speech language therapists do it, but it's not a it's not discipline, it should be. And we need standards and methods for, for assessing needs. <coughs> I think this is an extremely important agenda that can almost one to one be copied to our agenda. I look at Mark, director of catch. <laughs> so we have a discussion to go tomorrow. <laughs> um, and there's of course two important guiding principles when looking at when doing research in this field. Always use the, take the user as, as, a, as the key person and the user should always be involved. Uh, and we should stop thinking from a strictly medical model in diagnosis, because many technologies are not related to a specific diagnosis, but to a functional problem that can be caused by many different things. This is the content of this international agenda. Um, I will present one problem, one, one topic to show that it's not so easy. Um, just recently one of my PhD students finished her study and the thesis was accepted last week. <clears throat> and it's about arm supports. Did any one of you, you know that arm supports exist? 
No one. Yeah, you, of course, you will count it. <laughs> Close colleagues. Do you know how many there are on the market? No. Well, 50, 60, internationally. So how to choose from this? And she did a wonderful study, well, different aspects of the study. One was asking people uh, about their problems and how they got uh, connected to the, to the possibility of of assist technology. Simply by accident. What most people say, well, it just, it just because I heard about it, no one ever suggested, no physiotherapist, no physiotherapist suggested, well, this might be a solution. Just by accident, by hearing about it, by seeing it on a, um, somewhere on TV or whatever, and people say, hey, this might be a solution. So that shows that, that we don't have a system in place that really identifies people who, who might uh, be helped by this kind of technology. She also looked at when you get it, how did you get it, and how effective is it, what, what does it bring for you for your daily functioning. And that is really disappointing. Because about half of the patients, you, you have read it, uh, Mark, so I, I, maybe I'm wrong a little bit in the details, but about half of the users have no functional benefit of it. And that is not because technology is bad, but because the match between that solution and these very specific uh, limitations in functioning is not optimal. What we easily think is, well, technology is shit, don't do it. Now, the problem is, we need experts to make the right choice and to make sure that you get what you need. And when you talk about these kind of devices, that it sounds strange, but when you think about buying a smartphone, everyone has its preferences. Some people hate the iPhone, others can only work with, with another mic. It's exactly the same. So it's about, maybe you need the advice. So it's not simple, and, it is, and the, 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 the most crucial thing is it is not the technology. It is the choice of technology in relation to the functional abilities of someone. <clears throat> a similar example, different, is in robotics. It's more fancy, more. Um, do you have any idea? Yeah, if you have very good eyes, you can read it. <laughs> any idea how many service robots for elderly people are being developed worldwide? Right? You, you have good eyes, wonderful. And that without glasses. <laughs> There's an incredible amount of research going on to develop robots that will be able to function in my house and to support me in everyday activities. And it's a fantastic uh, field. What this colleague uh, uh, did, Sandra Bedoff, she studied what are the functional abilities of the computer of the robot and how does it compare to the functional needs of the people we build them for? And she studied why what are the, the factors that are cause that someone, an elderly person, cannot live independent anymore. So that leads to a kind of uh, a list of factors. Um, and she checked, she looked at what are the builders of these robots claiming as the functional game. And interestingly, all these builders say, this robot will enable people to live independently. But there is almost no relationship between the functionalities of the robot and the, and the reasons why people can't stay independent. So without looking at anything, you, can, you will know this was never going to work. And they will, none of them will be able to, um, yeah, to do what they claim. And that is an area we do need to do much more, much better research in that, uh, and involve users in robot development to really build the things that will help them. Uh, and when I look at this a little bit critically, this is not going to help. It's fantastic technology, and everyone likes the idea of having something, walking around and bringing your drink when you need it. Yeah. You know. I, I, I like this. <laughs> 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 yeah. But these examples, I try to show that it's, it's not an easy thing. It is not about the technology. It's, it's much more than that. And you need all the disciplines to do that in the right way. And so, again, you also need to collaborate internationally. If you look at where in Europe the expertise on assistive technology is, it's almost gone. Ten years ago, we had 
large institutions in Sweden, in Finland, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Italy, in the UK, working in this field, they are all gone. That's strange. Yeah, they are gone because this is, yeah, from a policy point of view, no longer interesting. Catch is one of the few places where we still say this is an important topic. The place where I come from, Science <coughs> University, is the second of these places, and I hope you keep it for a moment. There are some small groups still in Italy, and I think it's extremely important <coughs> to connect them. <clears throat> that is what we try to support from Catch. We support actively, and together with Zeit University, actively support the journal, Journal of Technology and Disability, which is the journal of the Association for the Advancement of Assistive Technology in Europe. But my colleague Peter is in the room, is the president of, and I will be the next. <laughs> but there is an attempt to connect uh, these, these tube spots that, that are still active in this field. Uh, we also organize a fantastic conference on these topics here in Sheffield in September. So take a good look, look at your calendar, take your smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, this will be a great event. Just come, because this is event will bring people together from over Europe, but also quite a number of people from Japan, from the United States, to discuss this area and talk about development. So we try to play an active role in, in bringing this field further. Well, that is um, almost the end of what I wanted to tell you. Um, I have not answered uh, the question. Uh, smart listeners will notice that, <laughs> yeah, because it's a difficult question. Of course, and I, what I hope to have done is to give a feeling of that this is an important field, that we should care, that we need a field that deserves attention, that deserves good, high quality research. And so I hope to um, change this, send, uh, this question into a, a, a thing with a, yeah, how do you say that? Oh, uh, Exclamation. An exclamation mark, <laughs> that's it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, technology, we care. Um, I think we should. So, to summarize, what I have tried to tell you is that healthcare needs fundamental disruptive innovations and, and redesign, rethinking of the whole system. That technology can enable that. Uh, Sheffield has all the has assets to become a key player in healthcare innovation. Just do it. Connect all the things we have available here. Um, if we do that, we should definitely also pay attention to assistive technology next to other fields. But, but I would really like this to be an important part of the program. And we must connect internationally. So if you remember this and uh, talk about that when you get home, I'm satisfied. Um, I only want to thank some people. I want to thank the university, uh, John Nickel and Mark, for asking me to come here. Which was, mm. <laughs> initially, I said no. Uh, but at this moment, I'm, I'm happy with it because it was a good step. I really enjoy the open atmosphere of the university. It's a really city also. It's a very good place to live. Extremely friendly people, and, and there is a lot of energy. Uh, you feel that when you walk to the street, but also when you are at work. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a real good step. So thank the university. I really want to thank my former colleagues, not only for coming here, but also for working with me. Um, how many years? Some 25. And they are where are you? <coughs> uh, over 25 years we worked together, uh, and that's what I left behind. Fantastic team, fantastic people. Uh, you are really people that um, add a dimension to the term colleague. And the fact that you are all here, well, there were more, but about 15, 12, 15 are here is, is absolutely wonderful and showing that. Um, I want to thank the ladies who have made this possible. Alvis has hidden herself, <laughs> 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 but she helped me a lot, and Laura has helped me a lot, and 
Simon Butler, so the fantastic new colleagues. I felt very welcome when I came. Um, and I hope that we can do great things. And finally, I would like to um, thank my wife and children. <laughs> Uh, and I really can't tell you how much I appreciate, and especially Charlotte, that you are always next to me, whatever crazy thing uh, I come up with. <laughs> and that is really amazing. And this is the first picture we took in the uh, first walk we made in the Peak District. And I realize it's not only a step for me, but a huge step for them. Yeah, they will have to switch schools, they have to switch friends, they will have to switch countries, language, everything. And that's amazing. Thank you very much for that. This is a really personal thing. Um, this is a picture of something that we have in our house, and it's a very silly thing. Um, but it shows a little bit how we um, are in our life. And the circumstances are not always um, very good, but we have one fantastic ability is to keep dancing. <laughs> if you are interested to see a bit more of what I was talking about, please come tomorrow <coughs> to this beautiful place in the center of Sheffield. And we will demonstrate things for the public, and you're all more than welcome. And I think I will leave it with that. I have no idea how I am at my time, but I have nothing more to say. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>